morning, I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This, the show where we want you to consider the news of the day and then reconsider it. Let's begin with Bursay 2.0's call for the immediate re uh, uh, registration of those who are 18 years and above. And this is um, uh, even if the, uh, the automatic regist uh, voters registration mechanism is not ready. Responding, I believe, to the EC's comments saying that, well, they need to look at all considerations before UNDI 18 can be implemented. And this process could take between 18 to 24 months, Sherrod. Yeah, what I think Bursay is uh, reminding us of, it was this wonderful energy that came from the campaign to get young people, or lower their voting age, get them to participate in the future of the country. Now, uh, while everybody understands that there are complexities involved, there are legal issues, there are interministerial issues, there are databases that have to be linked, yeah. and all kinds of things that need to happen uh, and will take time. In the intervening months and years, there will be by-elections. Now, the question is, should young people then be left ah. out of that process? Okay, so, you know, all the 18-year-olds who, in the pro it, while waiting for the automatic, register, uh, automatic voter registration to be put in place, will not be able to vote in, say, by-elections of Kimanis, for instance, or even the Sarawak State uh, election that could be happening pretty soon. So what we're very focused on the general elections, we're missing out, you know, young people are missing out on an opportunity to be part of the democratic system through these um, by-elections. Right. I think there's also a very interesting principle here, right? On one hand, you have a legal and bureaucratic processes that need to be respected so that the integrity of the system is upheld. But you also are reminded that if there's a will, there's mm -hmm. political will, they will find a way. And the way <laughs> is, uh, so the trade-off is really m including people. So if inclusion and the politics of inclusion are the principles by which the Pakatan government is going to push forward, mm. then this must happen. Well, okay, if I could just play devil's advocate for a second, I'm just wondering whether this is something that we need to rush because as you mentioned you know there are processes to be to be put in place it takes time to amend laws to take a look at you know putting all these the ecosystem in place is this something we want to rush given its importance well precisely because it's important to include people in the electoral system mm. and if you remember so many of the problems we had in the past uh, emanated from the, uh, the authorities kind of adhering to the letter of the law, not to the spirit of the law, right? Oh. So kind of saying, well, we can't do this because the laws, you know, prohibit this or the other, or interpreting the laws in the most conservative way possible. What you want this government to do uh, is to interpret it in a way that adheres to the principles of inclusivity and participation and to go the extra mile. I think that's what Bursi <laughs> Bursi is very well aware of the legal complexities. All right, well, the other story that caught our attention today is a business story, Aurora Mulia Syndrome Berhad, which is a firm linked to Tycoon Tansri Said Mokhtar Al Bukhari, has bought another 2.7% share stake in Media Prima Berhad. That means that this company now owns. 23% of Media Prima. What do you make of this, Sherrod? Well, you know, okay, so this is an interesting story in that, you know, when we talk about democratization and moving the country forward in terms of participation, we put power in the hands of young people through the vote. But who actually controls the le levers of power in this country? Who owns it? And who are those who are associated with the power mm. brokers, the political <coughs> party power brokers in this country, who actually haven't inordinate amount of influence and so when we look at those who own media for instance whether they're individual uh, entrepreneurs like Sagmotka or their companies that have uh, political party associations like Huaren uh, that owns the star you have there a sense of how power is actually distributed in this well, country. Okay, so the reason I thought this uh, story was particularly interesting was that, okay, Aurora Mulia wanted this stake in Media Prima so much that they paid a premium for it, a 28% premium for this 2.7% share stake. This is the fourth time that Aurora Mulia has purchased Media Prima. Now, what does this mean in terms of the, uh, the landscape, the media landscape, right, in terms of ownership? So it means that media ownership in Malaysia could very well be controlled by a few. And is this something that we really want? Looking at uh, Said Mokhtar 
Tan Sri Said Mukhtar Abu Khari's ownership. So it, it, it turns out it could be that he has, uh, according to The Edge and to the Singapore Straits Times, that he has also a 12% so stake in Media Prima that is held by a proxy, so held by Mitsubishi UFJ Financial. If you combine these two stakes together, he could potentially own 36% of Media Prima. You know what, Melissa, all this that you explained reminds me is how complex institutional and corporate uh, you know, linkages are, whether it's in terms of ownership and who owns a stake in companies that are not necessarily often visible to the public right. or to the, to the lay person who doesn't understand corporate Malaysia, is that all of it hides how power is in fact distributed. Sure. Now, the question is, what does government do? Do, especially with uh, industry like media where perhaps investments require huge amounts of uh, you know outlay mm. so do we have laws for instance that promote or policies that promote diversity of ownership in the media do we have ways of thinking about the media especially as other countries have done you know starting up or enabling community radio for instance all these ways of democratizing and devolving power from the very rich and very powerful in any country do, do you think that uh, media ownership is something that should be regulated i mean or should it be left up to market forces you know supply and demand it's willing buyer willing seller should it be left up to market forces? Well, I mean, I think all governments uh, seek to regulate in, you know, in a way that either can be enabling, but yes, we, we, we think of the market as, um, you know, as, the, as the best way to, in fact, uh, uh, you know, structure arrangements in terms of ownership and who mm. can do the best thing. But governments have a role in that if they see that certain political powers or interests have inordinate control over a system, they should jump in right. and regulate it to make sure, on the basis of what? The principle of democratizing the media. Okay. I think. Well, speaking about inordinate control, now just how, what, what do we mean by inordinate control, right? So, as I mentioned earlier, so 36, uh, so Tan Sri Said Mokhtar Bukhari has the potential to own 36% of uh, Media Prima. He also owns 14% of Utusan. Now, if we can just pull up this visual that's on my laptop, it is also believed that he is the whole, uh, he wholly owns the uh, publisher of the Malaysian Reserve. Now, what does this mean if this is all true? It could mean that there could be a consolidation of some of these papers, particularly interesting with the Malay language papers because Media Prima under the NSTP umbrella owns Brita Harian and Harian Metro. So if Said Mokhtar owns Utusan, and could, that, could we be seeing a consolidation of Utusan and Brita Harian? Could we be seeing a, a consolidation of Cosmo with Harian Metro? This will be very interesting in terms of who controls the narrative for the Malay speaking media. Right. And that, of course, is also part of the kind of the future of politics in the country. Utusan in its recent debacle, uh, you know, had a lot of people say, well, we don't want to see Utusan die. But of course, Utusan was closely tied to the previous administration, of course, Amno as a party, and wasn't necessarily seen as a champion of either balanced journalism or, in, in any respects, uh, some, you know, a, a media organization that championed democracy. So uh, it's a very complex field to play, but I do think that. Uh, um, uh, giving clarity yes. to the complex uh, corporate arrangements that underscore uh, these things that we consume on a daily basis okay. is Some, important. Something to think about. I also want to highlight a story that's quite interesting. Tun Dr. Madhya Muhammad, the Prime Minister, gave a press conference today in which he announced that as part of the government's bid to curb corruption, body-mounted cameras will soon be issued to enforcement personnel of agencies. He says that are susceptible to abuse. Now, here we have a clip from him, from that press conference. Uh, we can see what he, uh, the person is doing, the officer is doing to the, the client. That is very important. But there are other things like CCTV, which has to be installed in uh, certain places. This also applies to the police, because sometimes uh, the the um, lock up and all that we will need to have cameras so that we will know what actually happened. So he's saying that for certain officers so that uh, uh, we can see what they are doing and if they turn it off, we will also know. This is quite interesting because this is the way that the government is saying 
one way for them to curb corruption is so that surveillance, surveillance of everything you do. Do you think it will be effective? Well, why not? I mean, I think it's a tool in a, in a, in a, in a toolkit that we all need uh, or governments need and societies need to, uh, to get, you know, get to the heart of the, 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 the game of corruption, right? It's not, I don't think, a panacea. I don't think it's going to work for everything in, uh, in every circumstance and for all peoples. But it, it's interesting because it's not going to be just surveillance of the police officer. It's also been surveillance of ordinary people. Yeah, and, and sometimes, you know, there's a willing buyer, willing seller when it comes to... Uh, uh, you know, corrupt practices, right? Mm. Uh, I've violated the law. The enforcement officer turns up. I say, hey, you know, uh, perhaps we can ah, settle this, right? So and caught so, in the act of offering a yeah, bribe. Yeah, well, potentially. I don't know how these cameras work. Can you just block it out and mute it or rip it off? Uh, you know. Well, I think it's interesting uh, because you're right. It's perhaps one bullet in the arsenal of a way to fight corruption. In the US, you see that with the police, you know, wearing these uh, uh, body-mounted cameras a way to, I guess, fight against a litigious society, but also to protect not just the police officer, but also the public. Now, I would be particularly curious to see how they're going to implement it because, again, it's the, you know, the devils and the detail implementation is important. But also, uh, the, the government will also be seeking to install more CCTVs in police lockups. So that's something that I welcome as well. Right, because we've had because custodial deaths mm. and so on in uh, police lockups. What's also interesting is it this balance out, uh, I think, a discourse that often talks about, uh, you know, giving people morality or talking to them about good practices. Uh, that kind of cultural, uh, you know, uh, kind of approach, I think it's good, but it's not foolproof. And also, I think... Um, is based on a kind of uh, a notion or assumption that if you know what is right, you will do the right thing. Right. But sometimes you know what's right to do and you still do the wrong still thing. Still do the wrong thing. <laughs> okay, we're going to keep a close eye on that story as it develops. But after this, we're going to come back and take a look at uh, citizenship equality. Stay tuned.